You're listening to The Voice of Russia from London. I'm Simon Parker, and today I'll be discussing the topic of food security now and in the future. As global populations continue to rise around the world, concerns grow over how people will be able to feed themselves in the decades to come. The human population currently stands at approximately 7 billion people, but the United Nations predict that in 2050 it will reach a staggering 9.6 billion. That's an increase of 40%. This swelling of the human population will heap more strain on our ability to produce enough food. The United Nations predict that one-third of all the food we produce is wasted due to poor infrastructure, our desire for food that consistently looks and tastes the same, and overbuying. Campaigners have also warned that we are relying too much on intensive farming to feed the world. This includes crops like soya, wheat and maize, but perhaps more worryingly livestock. Currently, the global appetite for meat means that 312 million tonnes are eaten every year, and critics argue that this hunger for protein is far from sustainable. While the United Nations say that they have a solution, they suggest that insects are the answer to the future of global food security. Eaten by hundreds of millions of people around the world, especially in Africa and Asia, insects are said to be the food of the future, and eating more of them will provide us with a low-fat source of nutrition and reduce the pollution caused to the planet by rearing livestock. With me to discuss the future of feeding a growing global population is Shami Radia, co-founder of the company Eat Grub. Eat Grub source and sell edible insects and host insect food events. Seb Holmes also joins me in the studio. Seb is Eat Grub's head chef and works with Shami to create a host of interesting new insect recipes. And on the line, we're joined by Philip Limbury, CEO of the organisation Compassion in World Farming. They aim to highlight issues surrounding intensive farming around the world. Philip, I think you're probably the perfect place to start on a discussion like this. Uh, what impact is intensive farming and the intensive farming of, let's say, traditional livestock having on our environment? Well, industrial agriculture, intensive farming is having an enormous impact. And that is something which I explored in a recently published book, Farmageddon, The True Cost of Cheap Meat, uh, which shows how putting animals in large numbers, caged, crammed and confined on factory farms, um, doesn't actually save land. It means that animals are in a concentrated place where uh, potential pollution builds up. And the animal's feed is grown elsewhere on ghost acres, vast areas of land that are uh, often cultivated in monocultures, single crops, often using artificial fertilizers, pesticides and the like, which bring its own environmental damage. Uh, and it's worth recognizing that in Europe, uh, the artificial fertilizers, most of it is used to grow animal feed, and that it costs us, the taxpayer, 50% more to clean up the environmental pollution from the use of that artificial fertilizer than the, than the value, the monetary value that the entire farming industry gets from it in the first place. So it's a big big issue. But does that not show that we do have something of a, an insatiable appetite for meat and for protein? And, and could, could perhaps insects, as the UN suggests, be the answer to that, the future for that? Well, on my current understanding, I can certainly see how insects can play their part in a diverse food system. But one thing that we have to understand is that industrial farming of animals is far from efficient. It is very inefficient in that we are growing on, on vast areas of land uh, cereals and soya to feed those animals, and those animals then waste it. Uh, they waste 70% of the food value in conversion to meat, milk, and eggs. Now, this is madness, given that so much of the Earth's land surface and, and is covered by pasture. And if the animals were on that pasture, then they could convert stuff we can't eat grass and marginal lands into stuff we can. As it is, we are taking up a land area equivalent to the entire European Union to grow feed for industrially reared animals globally. That's an awful lot of land being used in a most inefficient way. Mm. Shami Radia, you're the co-founder of the company Eat Grub. You buy and sell insects. How do you react to what Phil said there? He said that we're using up a huge amount of space to produce 
this protein source? Because unfortunately, not everyone's a vegetarian. Some people do have that desire to eat meat and eat protein. Are insects the answer? I mean, you, you've invested heavily into your business. You obviously feel they are. What we're doing at the moment is unsustainable. And I haven't got a, science, a, you know, a background in, you know, in farming or in the kind of sustainability side of it. But in terms of the, the concentration of um, the way we're farming, the way we're farming animals at the moment, it is unsustainable. We, the world hasn't got the resources, hasn't got the water, it hasn't got the land, it hasn't got the feed um, to kind of fulfil this um, growing, um, to fill the needs of the growing population. But at the same time, I think insects provide a decent alternative because you can farm them in such smaller spaces. They require a lot less resources, a lot less feed, a lot less um, water. Um, it, just for example, the inefficiency of using the feed to convert that into traditional livestock protein. Beef requires 12 times more um, feed in terms of producing this, the equivalent amount of protein as crickets do. So mm. crickets are much better at converting feed into protein and at producing the kind of the equivalent gram for gram in protein. I think this is a good time to bring in Seb home. Seb is your, your head chef who works with you at Eat Grub. What Shami has is, is described, it sounds quite perfect to have a, a protein source which doesn't require so much energy or produce to, to put into it to, to produce this food source. But What's it like in terms of trying to convince people to eat this? It's really easy to cook with. It's actually very, very nice. It's like it's I, I completely for me. It's something that at first I kind of I found it a bit hard to get my head around, as many people do with insects. But as soon as you start cooking with it, it's, it just becomes another ingredient with its own flavour and its own ways of using it. And it's it's a, a really great product. That's the thing. So it's also like as when you're talking about earlier, it's not. I've never thought of it as something that's going to completely take away meat from from people's diet. It's just it also accompanies it well. I've made many dishes using pork and beef and the insects and buffalo worm salts and flowers and stuff as well. So it's it's a good way of incorporating these things together and for a, a more sustainable way of living. And it actually tastes nice. So you think that the future of using insects would almost be to supplement the desire for protein and for meat? Uh, yeah, I think it, it has many, many. You, you could There's going to be people that happily eat insects on their own, and there already is, and they've been doing it throughout history. But for, for us in the West, I think definitely it's something that's going to happen. Like people are going to eat it on their own. People will mix them together. I don't see why. There's absolutely no reason why not. Simon, what I really like about what... Uh, Shami and Seb are doing is that they are uh, they've got new and interesting ways to not only feed people but also challenge the notion that we need factory farming because you know, when you look at it uh, in the cold light of day factory farming is perhaps the most inefficient and unnecessary way of producing food of producing protein um, as well as being the biggest cause of animal cruelty on the planet I think one of the things that we also should um, uh, home in on is the fact that we do live in a world of plenty. Uh, the current food system globally produces enough food for up to 14 billion people uh, already. That's more than all the people now and in, in the foreseeable future. The trouble is we waste so much of it. We waste it uh, in, uh, by throwing stuff away in our homes, in manufacturing and so on. Uh, but also the biggest single area of food waste on the planet is this thing of growing food, human edible crops, and then feeding them inefficiently to factory farming. Mm. So, again, you know, what I really like about uh, Shami and Sebastian's ideas here is that they're challenging that, if, that, that, uh, that, that failed notion from the 20th century with new and interesting culinary ideas. Philip, something which I'm particularly interested about is um, discussing with you the, this desire for meat and desire for especially intensively farmed meat. I think in the introduction I said that there's 312 million tonnes of meat consumed around the world every single year. To excuse the pun, is, is it a chicken and egg situation? Are we consuming more meat because more meat is there? Or do we have these primal desires to eat all this meat? I don't. What, what's going on in your opinion? Well, in my opinion, what's driving this uh, desire for meat is uh, factory farming and, and, and the whole sort of consumptive marketing industry that goes uh, around it. And let's be clear, if uh, the whole world 
uh, if the whole world's population as it stands ate uh, as much meat as in America, then we would need uh, not just this planet, but probably a couple of others too, uh, to sustain ourselves. So uh, business as usual, going on as we are at the moment, um, isn't uh, the, the way forward. But the other thing here, Simon, is that we waste so much food, not just uh, vegetables and human edible crops to factory farms, but meat as well. In Britain alone, we waste the meat equivalent of 110 million animals. Globally, we waste the meat equivalent of 12 billion farm animals, reared, slaughtered, and then just put in the bin. That is something which must change. And that is something which, if we don't, then we'll rue the day, because I think we'll trash the planet. Seb, do you have a, a, anything to say about that, your reaction to yeah, Philip's comments? Yeah, I was comments? just going to say, that's, I, I completely agree, and that's part of the reason why, as when Chami came to me with Eat Grub, why it interested me so much, because I've worked, I've worked in the catering industry all my life, I'm now in London, where it's a busy place, and it's just almost naturally, so much food goes to waste. It's, it's just crazy. So just to see how, it, like, no, no, some people don't even blink an eye, you know, when you come in and you start at the bottom of the chain in the kitchen and you're cooking with this food... It has to be thrown away, and there's so much that can be done to change that, but it's almost routine now. But could there be any difference using insects as a food source? Is that waste, human error, is that something down to just humans being wasteful? Or are insects a less wasteful source? I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting topic again, because insects, you know, where we're talking about the kind of grains that we're feeding our, our traditional livestock, insects are a lot more, they're a lot less fussy when it comes to food. Um, and, you know, the kind of the vegetable waste could easily feed insects and they can convert that into protein. And I think one of the key things here is that the West is the biggest consumers of meat, whereas insects are eaten all around the world as a supplement to people's diets and often not as a kind of necessity, but even in some cases as a luxury. And I think it's about changing the mindset of people in the West where they're, they're kind of fixed on these kind of on beef, pork, chicken, and to kind of get them to realise that there's other more sustainable sources of protein, which from Grub's point of view as well, whilst the sustainability and the nutrition is important, it's not, it's not what's going to get people eating insects, it's the taste. Well, I guess that's the crux of where your business is coming at at the moment, because, I mean, you, you have these pop-up restaurants, but I guess at yeah. the moment it's almost a gimmicky thing, isn't it? You get, there's... There's people from around London wanting to go to a pop-up yeah. restaurant to try these things. It naturally uh, becomes that. That's the thing. But it's, uh, it's trying to do it differently. Every attempt so far has been gimmicky, but by, by us applying it to, a, to like a, a, a very popular cuisine at the moment, Thai street food in London, and, use it and, and putting it across in a different way, we're trying to come across more as educational, kind of try this and see what you can do. And that's why we sell them wholesale as well. So it's more trying to teach people how to use them at home. Of course, several hundred years ago, there would have been food stuff that which we're consuming now, which people would have never seen before. People would have looked at bananas and thought to themselves, God, I'm not eating that. Absolutely, what the yeah. hell is that? But now, but now it's everywhere. You know, so, yeah, I, I mean, think, how are things going to develop? I think sushi is a, probably quite a good example. I mean, 10, 15 years ago, um, it didn't work when it was first introduced in the UK. It was about how it was marketed by companies like Yo Sushi who came and made an experience out of it. And I think that's what we're trying to do at Grub. I think the kind of main thing is we understand that people want to try it in terms of the novelty. Um, but what we're trying to move people away from is the whole celebrity get me out of here, you know, where they eat an insect, it explodes in their mouth. It's, it's not how it is, and I guess what we look for is someone to come to our restaurant, try the food, think it was an excellent, and actually think, I'm going to try that again. If we've done that, then we've succeeded. If people come to our events and they say, oh, OK, I've tried insects, I'm never going to eat it again, then we've failed as a business. Well, I think that is probably the perfect moment to segue into trying some of the stuff which you guys have bought in. First things first, Seb, why don't you describe to us what we've got here and what we're about to try? So this dish is essentially a sweet, um, so it's like having a toffee, um, but uh, it's based on a traditional Thai dish called a miang, uh, which is a mixture of fresh ingredients, uh, with a sauce made out of coconut, peanuts, palm sugar, chilli, um, and tamarind. Uh, but instead, tamarind is essentially a sour element to, this, uh, to the sauce, which is normal, but I've done this one dried. So instead of using tamarind, I use buffalo worms, which are naturally sour. So you make a powder out of them, mix them through, and then this is with shallots, 
fresh lime and some fish sauce, roasted grasshoppers, just to balance out the sweetness with a bit of salt. Well, it, it certainly, I'm going to uh, dive in and, and grab one now. It certainly smells like anything else I would get from a, a Chinese or a Thai restaurant. So I think I'm going to go for it. Think of it as a toffee. So you might like eat it in a couple of bites. It's quite, it's, it's a sweet, uh, sweet snack. And uh, a little squeeze of lime if you want. And yeah, I'll have a bit, bit of lime. Has it been important for you guys to try and latch on and almost piggyback onto other cuisines? For example, you wouldn't want to create a, a mealworm sausage and mash or a, a, a cricket uh, and vegetable pie or something. It's important that this is a, of, yeah. of Asian cuisine. I mean, I think, I think a lot of, lot of the companies out there who are cooking with insects, um, they, they've tried it in different ways. They've, they've tried it in... They've tried mealworm burgers. They've tried grasshopper tacos. And I think for us, it's, this is the traditional, you know, the, we, we're getting inspired by the traditional ways that insects are eaten in Asia. And obviously we, we found, we were lucky to find Seb, whose background is in Thai street food. And I think it works perfectly because I think the flavours, the, the kind of traditional ways that uh, insects are eaten in Thailand works really well with, um, with what we're doing got a smile on your face it is good that. it really is good i don't know how to react that's the thing um, <laughs> if you hadn't have told me if it, for example if it was packaged up and no one had told me that there was um a cricket in it is it, it's a cricket yeah grasshopper. Buffalo worms a grasshopper. And grasshoppers. then it would just taste like any other sweet kind of sweety sour. salty slightly spicy recipe which i would ever get from a thai restaurant so philip sorry to leave you out dangling on the phone there <laughs> is this something you'd be interested in if you went to a restaurant and someone uh, put this in front of you, what would your reaction be? Well, personally, I'm, I'm a vegetarian, so it, it wouldn't be the kind of thing that I would naturally go for in a restaurant, but my organisation, Compassion in World Farming, is not a vegetarian society, and, and uh, it, you know, it's very much a broad church organisation. I mean, one of the things I can say, Simon, is that a decent food that's humanely reared in a way which is environmentally friendly tends to taste so much better. This is something which people have, have told me all around the world as I was writing Farmageddon, and it was a three year journey to write that book. I went to countries like uh, China, uh, Mexico, the US, Peru, and Argentina. Everywhere I went, people said to me, when you get away from factory farming, when you have food that is produced uh, on pasture, free range, organic, and the like, then the food tastes so much better. So I, I can certainly uh, you relate to the experience you're having in the studio where you know, food which is uh, much more light in terms of resources on the land you know, is likely to taste that much better. Seb Holmes, uh, you're the head chef from Eat Grub. How do you react to what uh, Philip Limbury said? There? I, was, I was just going to, uh, out of curiosity, Philip, just going to ask, as a vegetarian, what you, if you would ever try insects. We've had a few, um, I think we've had about six now, if I remember rightly, that have come to our pop-ups uh, and eaten the whole seven courses and, and loved it. And uh, so it's just, uh, it's kind of like a grey area that I'm still I mean, yeah, trying for, to work out. For example, out. a vegetarian, currently I, I gave up meat about six months or, or a year ago, and I'm one of those strange vegetarians who still eats fish. Looking at this, you know, I, I just dived in and I ate it. I didn't mm. really think about it because it, it doesn't have the same stigma as perhaps a, a cow or a pig in a, in a, in a horrible barn somewhere, mm. you know. That's, yeah. for me, the, part of the kind of like ethical kind of thing which this surrounds is what interests this. Me. I, yeah. love, I love people, people's reactions to eating food and, and the way they think about it and to have, to have stumbled across something completely new and unheard of. It's, quite, it's, a, well, it's a strange... I think on area. that note, I mean, let me put this to you. Where do we draw the line? I think there's a certain grey area in terms of animals and the welfare of animals. Because, for example, I was discussing this with a, a colleague earlier. We are all probably guilty of once swatting a fly or um, stepping on a, a spider but none of us would put a gun to a, a cow's head and kill it. So is there almost uh, a difference in the ethical idea of the way we treat animals? And, and if so, where do insects um, sit in that spectrum? I mean, I wouldn't... Uh, this is an interesting um, topic, which is probably... Um, you know, it's not going to be solved in a half-an-hour radio show or, or ever. But I just think, you know, in terms of um, the way you treat animals that you're eating... Um, you want to try and keep their environment as natural as possible. And I think that's the difference when we're talking about eating meat. Uh, a cow shouldn't be kept in a kind of pen where it can't move, it can't even turn around. Um, and I think that's what a lot of vegetarians struggle with. Um, 
Whereas I think with insects, you know, their 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 natural habitat is in a kind of you know it's a small space. They don't need a lot of space to enjoy a natural life. And I think you can achieve that with farming insects, whereas you can't achieve that with the kind of you can't achieve that with the intense farming of pigs and. Mm cows and chickens that philip was talking about yeah philip limbury you're from uh, uh, compassion in world farming so i'm sure you've got a lot to say about this how what yeah. do you, how do you react to what we've been saying well yeah, i think that uh, it's very much in the right direction uh, in europe we have got legal recognition uh, at long last for uh, for farm animals as sentient beings you know legal recognition that pigs chickens cows and so on um, have the ability to feel pain and suffer. Uh, I mean, this, this, there's no news there, I think, for most of us, but particularly pet owners. We know that instinctively. So the legislation has finally caught up with that reality. I, I suppose my take on it is that you know, we have to uh, give, uh, we have to grant animals uh, the benefit of the doubt that if we're not sure whether they uh, whether they are you know have the capacity to suffer, then we have to assume that they do. Yeah. And certainly, I would suggest that any animal that's got a backbone, uh, then it's going to uh, most likely have that, those feelings of of, of, of 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 pain and suffering. And if we allow them to to have a feeling of joy too, so. Taking animals' uh, feelings, taking animals' welfare seriously is a big part of the future. Um, I, I do like the idea that uh, insects could play a part of the diet of the future. Anything that which gets us away from you know, the inefficient uh, and unnecessary madness of the factory farm has got to be a good thing. Yeah, I think something, something which is Im important is um, I think all of you will have an interesting perspective on this. Um, is it possible for us to ever farm or manufacture a sustainable food source, this whole idea of sustainability? If we get to a point where we are commonly eating insects, will our tastes and our appetites always outrun that and outdo that? Have we not shown that with everything we've, we've farmed and produced, that unfortunately the, the human palate and the human appetite gets to a certain point where we just want to consume it all? Is that not something, I know I'm playing uh, devil's advocate, but is, is that not something which is uh, potentially going to happen with anything we produce? I, mean, I think it's a risk because, I mean, as you say, I mean, humans kind of uh, seem to be naturally greedy. Um, but again, with insects, I mean, they, you know, they require so much less land and resources than our traditional sources of protein do that I think, you know, there's less risk of us destroying the planet or, you know, using up our resources if we start moving towards farming alternative sources of protein. And plus, they don't release any carbon emissions. They don't release methane. So they're not, they wouldn't contribute to global warming as, um, you know, say, say cows do. Seb Holmes, you've been cooking with these for over a year now. Firstly, how easy are they to cook with? How, can someone literally just pick them up and start throwing them into um, to recipes? And, and also, what about the, the nutritional uh, benefits, the health benefits? Well, the nutritional benefits are actually, I, I mean, have we brought any statistics with us today? No, actually, yeah, got... really, uh, yes. Um, I hope Shami should be able to uh, fill you in with some of those in a moment. But they're, they're very, uh, well, they're, they're low, in, low in cholesterol, very high in protein. So they're, they're a great little snack on the go. They're, and they're very easy to work with as well. I mean, it's, it's the same as any ingredient. They can, you can make complicated recipes. You can, you can make simple, you can simply fry them. Or roast them uh, and have them either on their own or with salt and pepper. It's not. It's just it's just like a potato. You know, it's very mm. easy to use. Less preparation than a potato. Um, whereas otherwise you can you can puree them, turn them into salts, and make complicated dishes. Well, yeah, so it's they, just they, an ingredient. They definitely taste very good, and I'm not just just saying that. But I mean, it's going to be all about trying to shift perception, isn't exactly, it? Yeah. Especially it's changing I mean, preconceptions. Yeah. Um, and and. From your pop-up uh, restaurants, do you have any examples of people coming in being a little bit um, squeamish but then getting stuck into everything? That must happen quite a yeah, lot. Yeah, it does. Um, and I think, I guess, you know, as you come, and the way, we, the way we've done it is we've done it as um, street food where, you know, we pair it with alcohol, with some beer or some wine. And obviously it helps people to kind of feel a little bit more at ease here. And if you think about a group of friends that come along, there's going to be some that are adventurous, some that aren't. Um, and, you know, after a couple of beers, even those people who aren't adventurous, once they see the people who are enjoying it, 
then they start trying it themselves. And, you know, so far we haven't had any negative comments, which is, which is amazing for something which is so divisive as a, as a subject matter. The food has gone down really well um, from kind of the media as well as the public that have come to try it. So it's been a really positive reaction so far. Philip Limbury, just to go, go back one step about uh, human consumption and, and the appetites for food, do you think there is any way to ever curtail that the human desire to consume on such grandiose levels? Will we always just do that? Well, I think that we do um, face a situation where we are encouraged um, to eat more, to eat more of certain things, uh, meat and animal products. Uh, and, and I think that it's, it's society in general that needs to look at itself uh, and decide whether this is a sustainable way to go forward. And, and, you know, I say that within the context of the fact that we do live in a world of plenty. We do have a current food system that produces enough food for all of us uh, today and in the future, for up to 14 billion people. If only we didn't waste it, feeding it to factory farms and throwing it in our bins. I think the other thing is that uh, what I, again, I really like about uh, about what, Eat Grub is doing is that they are challenging our perceptions of what is good, what is tasty. And I think there are other things that uh, should be brought into that equation too. For example, seaweed, a relatively small area of, of sea could grow enough seaweed to produce the protein needs of 9 to 10 billion people. Uh, in, in Wageningen and where they're researching not only seaweed but also the use of insects, uh, there's been some work going on not very far away at a related laboratory into uh, cell culture meat, so laboratory produced meat um, that, that doesn't involve any animals. Uh, and, and they reckon that that's seven to ten years away from being marketable. These are all new and interesting ways, but I think that they all lead in the same direction, which is a, a more, more colourful, more, more diverse more uh, sustainable and humane way to feed ourselves. I think uh, we're almost running out of time now, but I'd just like to give um, Shami a, a final uh, minute or so, because I think what uh, Philip has, has raised there is very interesting. I think you demonstrate a, an entrepreneurial ship and almost uh, coming up with different ideas, which, which Philip has just raised. Do you think that that's the, uh, the key for coming up with new f food types? We just, we try and open our minds and see and see how we can tackle this problem as a whole? I think so. I mean, again, as I said uh, earlier, I think the sustainability and the nutritional part of new foods, the foods that aren't common in, in the West, uh, it's hard to break down. So it's how, it's how those foods are marketed. Um, and it's about trying to make them more accessible to, to people. And whether that's done in kind of breaking down insects, for example, um, you know, or with the seaweed. It's about getting people to try them and to try to kind of change those misconceptions. So I think with us, the focus is it has to be taste, to actually get people to realise that they taste good. And once you do that, it's word of mouth. People can, you know, start telling their friends um, that actually insects, they taste pretty good. And hopefully, you know, once that's done, then you start breaking down and, you know, that that, that whole kind of... Uh, aspect of insects being you know dirty or uh, kind of a taboo food you know changes unfortunately that's all we have time for today but before we go i'd like to thank my guests for joining me on the line i was joined by philip limbry ceo of the organization compassion in world farming and in the studio i was joined by shami radia co-founder of the company eat grub and seb Holmes. seb is eat grub's head chef you're listening to the voice of russia from london from me simon parker Goodbye.